Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So uh, welcome to this morning's presentation, AV Collections Planning a Reformatting Project, uh, which is brought to you by Diphony, the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York. My name is David Neary from the Whitney Museum of American Arts and Media Preservation Initiative. Today we'll be discussing moving image and audio assets in the archive and how to plan for their digitization. We'll be running through a quick introduction to different kinds of physical media commonly found and regularly ignored in the archive today, and discussing some basic and not so basic methods for digitization. We'll then be looking at options around outsourcing digitization projects to vendors before suggesting how you might decide which option is best for your archive and your collection. Just a quick recap for, for those of you who are new to this webinar series. Uh, Dipsney is a five-year initiative, now in its third year, to deliver essential training and services to New York's collecting institutions. Dipsney services include archival needs assessments, preservation and conservation surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and access to a variety of educational programs and workshops. Dipsney is making these services available free of charge to New York-based organizations that collect, preserve, and make accessible historical records and or library research materials. Dipsney is a collaboration between two long-running New York programs, the New York State Archives Documentary Heritage Program and the New York State Library Conservation Preservation Program. It was established in 2016 by the New York State Education Department's Office of Cultural Education to ensure consistent and comprehensive services to the vast network of organizations that safeguard New York's records and make them accessible. So let's talk about the analog media in your collection. Um, before we get to reformatting, it's pivotal that you're able to identify the AV assets in your collection. Um, most holding institutions have some form of analog media collection. Perhaps it is the home movies of one family donated to your collection as historical records, or videos your institution made of lectures and other special events held over the decades. Perhaps it is one audio cassette containing the oral history of a single individual, or several hundred containing the entire broadcast history of a local radio show. There are millions of tapes. Sorry. Um, there are millions of tapes and reels sitting on shelves in archives around the world, and your archive is likely no exception. While for simplicity's for simplicity sake, we often break these down into film, video, and audio, this forgets the dozen dozens of different types of formats that exist within those media types. Two types of video format may require preservation uh, efforts as different as a manuscript from a sculpture. This is not even taking into account the relation between these media, media types. Both film and video can have audio components. Indeed, an acetate, film, an acetate film reel may even have a magnetic soundtrack. Demand for access to AV assets continues to grow in the era of, of new media. And if that weren't enough, there's been a growing awareness since acetate color fade was first documented in the 1970s that the longevity of analog media co collections is far from guaranteed. Thus, Reformatting AV collections has a twofold benefit, creating a sustainable preservation uh, copy of the work, which can also be accessed by whoever the archivist desires. So what are the attributes of analog media, um, which are just as important to understand? Um, analog media components uh, are carriers of the data or record, uh, which when played back, produce the appearance of continuous motion or sound. They are relatively compact. Uh, while a film reel may take up a sizable amount of space on your shelf, consider that when projected, it presents 24 frames per second, 24 images per second. A five minute reel thus equals 7,200 separate images. Now imagine that many slides stacked on top of one another. While some carriers are more brittle than others, analog media tends to be extremely durable. Metal and plastic casings protect the, the reels, which themselves have to be made of tough plastics in order to endure the stresses placed on them by being pulled at high speeds. Disc media are notable exceptions to this. Having been record on, recorded onto, analog media can then be played back, provided two things. First, that the media carrier has been properly preserved and can still be read. And second, that a media player is actually still operational and available.
This is because in most analog media characters, signal is encoded. Whether it is the magnetic charge of particles in a videotape or the stylus grooves in a record, the signal can only be played or decoded by playing it back on a device with the same characteristics as the one that wrote it. The exception to this um, is the individual frames of motion picture film, which can be reviewed by unspooling the film, although equipment is still required to run the film at a sufficient speed to view it as a moving image. The encoded signals in analog media may be themselves analog, uh, such as in a VHS or, or, or record, or digital, such as in video formats like digital Betacam, or even computer hard drives. Some analog media types may become chemically unstable, such as the deterioration and shrinkage of acetate safety film through what's called vinegar syndrome, or the, deteriorate, or the deterioration of the binder that contains magnetic particles in video, which we refer to as sticky shed. These chemical processes can be kept at bay by properly storing the media as they are exacerbated by high temperature and humidity. The continued obsolescence of media types and the equipment needed for their playback has left more than 100 years of media collections at risk, but it is worth noting that some of the most endangered uh, are, are, are recent formats. This is because a growing appeal to mass consumer market from the 1970s onwards resulted in both the creation of numerous new to new media types, but also countless brands of video and audio cassette, many of inferior quality and with substantially shorter shelf substantially shorter shelf lives. Um, so the, the two major types of media we'll be talking about today are film and video. Um, you probably have some familiarity uh, with both, but uh, more recently probably been viewing digital versions of these. Um, but there's others, um, audio tape um, and groove media. Uh, audio, 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 audio tape can come in cassette or open reel for, format. Uh, groove media refers primarily to audio records, uh, but also to the earliest forms of analog media characters, such as wax phonograph cylinders. Um, then there's optical media, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and memory disks, which you may not have used for a few years. Um, I should clarify that while um, I'll be briefly touching on laser discs in this presentation. Uh, I won't really touch on CDs or DVDs or even various other memory disk formats uh, for two very different reasons. Uh, in the case of CDs and DVDs, it's because creating a disk image simply requires having a disk drive hooked up to your computer. Relatively easy. Uh, for floppy disks, it can be a lot more complicated. Uh, first, you need the correct drive, um, which is still, is still accessible. Um, but then you need, creating the disk image is actually very complex, and we just don't have the time for it today. Um, because of this, uh, optical media makes for a cheap and easy in-house re in reformatting project, while memory disks can be better suited to being handled by vendors. So um, let's just talk about the, uh, the properties of film for a moment. Um, uh, motion picture film is a series of images captured in a light-sensitive emulsion coated on a strip of acetate or polyester. The image is either a negative or a positive. A positive image is struck from a negative, from which further negatives can be, and, and then positives can be struck. Um, duplication leads to a lessening of quality between generations, uh, like with photocopying, essentially. Um, film is usually played at 24 frames per second, although other frame rates do exist, such as 16 frames per second, which was common for silent movies uh, before the 1930s. Um, Playing it at this speed creates the illusion of movement for the eye, which can only see at approximately 12 frames per second. Uh, while projectors or viewers, such as flatbed editors, are required to view the work as it is intended to be seen, individual frames can be um, inspected without complex equipment, allowing content to be documented. Film comes in a variety of formats called gauges. Uh, the kinds most likely to be found in an archive today are 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter, and Super 8, measurements that refer to the width of the frame on the film strip. 35 millimeter is mostly associated with large scale motion picture productions. Uh, 16 millimeter has been used for a, w a wide range from both theatrical works as well as home movies since the 1920s. It was also very common for uh, the news segments in uh, the 1970s and 80s. Uh, eight millimeter was an affordable silent format uh, designed for the consumer market, which was then superseded by Super 8 in the 1960s, uh, which allowed for better picture and later sound. Um, 
the size, um, also the, uh, the, 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 the size of the frame decides how many, spro how many sprocket holes or perforations um, there are, which allow them to move through the camera and projector. Uh, different film gauges, for this reason, different film gauges cannot share the same equipment. So to properly preserve and document your film, it's important to know what it's made of. Different synthetic compounds have been used over the years uh, as the substrate of or film base. Um, although cell cellulose triacetate, or safety film, has been the predominant kind for nearly 70 years. Polyester, a chemically stable replacement, has been introduced more recently for film prints. Nitrate film, discontinued in the 1950s due to its highly flammable nature, is unlikely to be uh, encountered in your archive. But if it is, find an institution that has a facility to take it from you as quickly as possible. Um, only 35 millimeter film was ever produced on nitrate stock. So if the film is not a 35 millimeter reel, there's absolutely no danger. Film may contain audio in the margins um, of, of the film strip, uh, either as an analog or, or uh, as an analog optical signal. Um, the examples here are analog, uh, shown here are analog optical. Uh, Analog electronic signal, which is a mag when a magnetic strip is along the side of the film strip. Uh, more recently, digital audio tracks have been added to film. Magnetic film strips are important to watch out for because the chemical chemicals in the magnetic film strip have been known to exacerbate uh, the effects of acetate degradation. Let's move on to magnetic media. Um, Magnetic media come either in reels or in cassettes, uh, which are, cassettes are just housings for the reels. Um, the, uh, the science of how uh, magnetic media works is, is far too complicated uh, to go into in, at this hour of the morning. But um, to put it simply, um, the reel is made up of a thin strip of plastic uh, coated in a binder that contains magnetic particles. As the strip passes th through the audio or video recorder, the device charges the particles, arranging them into a pattern within the binder that can then be read back by a player, recreating the sound or image. The signal in most kinds of magnetic media is analog, similar to traditional TV or radio signals. However, from the 1990s onwards, a number of video formats like DV cam, mini DV, digital beta cam, and audio formats such as DAT encoded the information digitally. So a wide variety of video formats have been prevalent from the 1950s until the present. Um, but video was ubiquitous from the 1970s to the 90s as it became the major medium for the consumer market. As we stated previously, the integrity to tape can differ dramatically. The integrity of the ta tape can, can differ dramatically between format and brand. Magnetic ta tape has a shelf life of approximately 20 to 30 years before it begins to degrade. It often becomes susceptible to binder hydrolysis or sticky shed syndrome, in which the binder that holds the magnetic particles begins to become sticky, which can flake off, or worse, clog up your machine, uh, which would make, make it uh, un unable to, to read it perfectly functioning tapes. Um, no new video equipment is believed to be being made today, uh, making it a fully obsolete medium. Decks are becoming harder to come by in working condition, and the number of small parts makes them more difficult to repair without cannibalizing another unit. Just to make this all the more complicated, I need to note that different territories throughout the world traditionally use different television signals, and thus came to use different video signals. The United States uses NTSC, while Europe uses PAL. Because of this, regardless of the format, PAL video cassettes will not play on standard NTSC tape decks and vice versa. If your video collection is largely domestic in origin, this shouldn't be a concern. But if you do have any um, tapes that originate in other countries, this can be a major hindrance to reformatting. So we're just going to quickly identify a few um, a few different types of magnetic media. Um, uh, quadruplex uh, was the first major video format introduced in the 1950s, um, specifically for for television broadcasts. Um, you can it's very easy to recognize um, 
for its size, its weight, um, those cases are incredibly difficult to lift. Um, one inch open reel uh, was a, a more manageable replacement uh, introduced in the 1960s. Uh, three quarter inch umatic, uh, sometimes just called three quarter inch, sometimes just called umatic, um, was introduced in the 1970s. It was particularly used for educational, industrial, journalism purposes, um, as well as by artists and community activists. Um, it's likely the earliest video format that you will find in your archive. Uh, VHS, I don't think needs much introduction, um, but I think it's worth uh, remembering just how long they were the main medium for recording. Um, that's almost 40 years of being, you know, a a a a a, a, a major medium. Um, so it is very possible that your collection is swarmed with uh, VHS tapes. Um, Apologies for that. Um, that says Betacam and DigiBeta. Um, uh, Betacam replaced Umatic as the uh, major professional uh, video format. Um, a digital equivalent, DigiBeta, uh, has remained in use until the very recent present. Um, the 8mm tape formats um, were quite popular in the 90s due to their size, their compact size. Um, the final release of those, uh, Digital 8, um, which encodes the signal digitally is um, particularly notable just because the players that they designed for it played also played video 8 and hi 8. Uh, and then there's uh, mini DV. Um, due to its tiny size uh, and the fact that it uh, recorded a good quality digital signal, uh, mini DV, DV became a major brand, especially for firms and political groups in the 1990s. Um, its camera also served as a player. Um, the main thing to know, however, is that the uh, the tapes were very prone to damage. The case could crack very easily, and the tape is so thin that it would tear um, quite 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 easily. Um, other formats that I've just I, I I'm skipping through um, uh, DV cam, half inch open reel, a later version of the one inch open reel, Beta Max, and there are actually many others, but. Uh, uh, the chances of you of, 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 of you find them in your archive are relatively slim. Um, so uh, just some quick comments on magnetic audio. Um, the uh, earliest form of uh, magnetic media, um, originally developed in the 1930s, um, but not popularized until the 50s. Um, quarter inch open reel uh, audio tape of, of, the, of the main open reels, uh, tapes, to one inch, half inch, and quarter inch. Quarter inch is the most likely you'll find in your archive. Um, it's particularly recognizable by these uh, thin square box, thin square cardboard boxes. The compact cassette, we all know these. Um, they were the audio equivalent of VHS, um, recorded in their millions during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Um, a more professional uh, brand was introduced in the late 1980s, um, which is uh, a digital audio tape, or DAT. Um, it uh, recorded high, fide high fidelity sound um, and encoded it digitally. Um, their cost and the fact that the tapes were very easy to damage, uh, the actual tape, tape um, reel, not the cassette, um, were very, very prone to damage. Um, they should be considered a major priority for reformatting like mini DV for this reason. So some other media types, I just want to, you know, put it all out there. Um, but uh, these, just because these are, are, are analog um, uh, forms, formats. Um, uh, photograph records, um, as the digitizing processes for these are very similar to magnetic audio. Um, the main thing that you should know is that if you do have different uh, makes of, um, of, of record, particularly like the like lacquer or, or shellac, um, which were much earlier forms than than vinyl, which we are so familiar with today. Um, the main thing they will play on any turntable that can play the record speed, but you will need a different stylus um, on the arm of the of the phonograph. Uh, so just just be be aware of this if you're doing uh, if you are attempting. Um, to, to digitize records in-house. Um, laser discs, um, not too common in the archive, but uh, important to mention just because although they are an optical media, like in 
similar to DVD and CD and CD, um, they are actually have an analog video signal, um, meaning that they need to be digitized in the same way that a videotape is and can't just be transferred over as digital files like a CD or DVD. Um, just some quick thoughts on, on, on caring for your assets. Um, you know, it goes without saying a little, but um, uh, analog media formats, you know, they have different storage requirements to print media. Um, temperature and humidity control are of utmost importance. Um, international Standards Organization's recommendations for color film, uh, as you can see, um, 36 degrees Fahrenheit at 20 to 30 degrees relative humidity, that's proper cold storage. Um, you want to keep your film films films cold and relatively dry. Um, magnetic media um, standards are not quite as um, as 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 cold, requiring of cold, but uh, it's you know the, the similarly cold and and and, and relatively dry um, conditions. Um, for long term preservation, particularly of of of, of film. Um, uh, cold storage is, is recommended. Films can even be frozen. Um, the only da real danger here is when you retrieve your films from uh, from um, cold storage is to make sure that you stage them properly so that a dew point is never reached. Um, otherwise, moisture can actually build up inside the film, which will do all the all the damage that you were trying to present and ever prevent in the first place. So um, keeping the archive dust free is already a priority, I know. Um, uh, lazy journalists love to talk about how dusty our archives are. Um, but you, you really need to consider the damage that dust will do to uh, analog media assets. Um, they can leave optical media unplayable altogether if they get on the other side, underside of a DVD. Um, audio and video tape, if they get on the actual ribbon uh, of, 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 of the tape, they can actually block the, um, the, uh, the, the signal from being read. Um, on film, if you get one speck of dust on a film, as soon as you project the film, the film appears like a pebble um, on, 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 on the screen. So um, yes, uh, dust-free environments, obviously important. Um, rehousing film can be expensive. Um, it is highly recommended uh, if the storage conditions are imperfect. Um, a lot of old film reels will contain um, paper uh, documentation, sometimes stuffed inside the the, the the cans. You know, you need to remove these sort of things. Um, you want to tightly wind your films, preferably onto a core, store in a, store to sort of flat in ventilated cans, as possible. Um, for cassettes, uh, the trick is to actually stand cassettes upright. Um, this keeps the uh, the tape from sliding down uh, against the flange inside the um, the thing that actually turns the the the, the, the tape from reel to reel. Um, that can create unwanted friction during playback. So uh, um, although the, this this photograph of, of a set is lying down, that is uh, <laughs> not ideal. Um, tape should also uh, be re be um, be rehoused as well. Um, inert plastic housing is ideal. Um, those uh, those old cardboard sleeves, I think you know these ones. Uh, they 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 need to be replaced um, as possible. Um, your nose is your best tool in identifying if your film or video video assets are in danger. Um, unless you're concerned there might be mold, uh, don't be afraid to give your films and tapes a good sniff. Um, this is the easiest way to identify binder hydrolysis or sticky shed and magnetic media carriers, as they give off a sort of waxy smell as they begin to decay uh, when the um, when it's a, when it's serious um, the uh, uh, the smell has been kind of described as um, dirty socks um, it's 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 potent you'll 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 you'll, you'll know it if, if, if you come across it um, vinegar syndrome in film uh, produces exactly the vinegar smell that it that it that the name suggests um, this is from the acetate actually turning back into um, the acids within it. Um, sometimes if a very vinegary film is in an archive, you'll actually smell it from outside the can. Um, and you'll certainly know the moment you open it, um, if it's a severe case. Um, the acidic air that uh, vinegar syndrome produces um, 
is known to catalyze decay in other films. So vinegar films should be isolated um, to a separate part of your archive if that's at all possible. Um, the Image per Permanent Institute um, sells um, acid strips, uh, AD strips, that can be placed inside a can and give a very good reading of the degree of acidity in a film reel, um, and thus whether or not vinegar syndrome has begun um, in just a matter of days. So viewing your collection, um, unless you have to, don't. Um, you don't want to put unnecessary wear on your tapes and reels, um, as well as on your media players. Um, if you if you are going to uh, play them, it's important that you inspect both the media carriers and the equipment carefully before use. Um, film can be looked at, um, though again not viewed on a rewind without subjecting it to the stress of projection. Uh, there is an argument made that uh, winding through a film reel once a year um, is good for its preservation, exercising the film, changing the air in it. Um, however, uh, undertaking this act uh, with your entire collection of film may be impractical. Um, but it's always good to document every time a film is wound through. So I'm just going to very quickly fire through some um, comments on, 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 on inspection. Um, to, you can set up a very, very easy film inspecting unit uh, in, your, in your archive for just a couple hundred dollars. Um, you can buy rewinds um, second hand. Um, the, uh, all you need then is a, is a flat surface to, to, to fasten them to and a light box. Um, once that, you just put the, put, put the films on the reels and you can wind through um, carefully. If you, if you preferably use, use gloves just to keep uh, oil, the oils from your fingers off them, but otherwise, um, uh, this can be one of the one of the one of the tricks I've used is to as to just roll through the through through the reel. If anything looks interesting or if anything needs identification, is to just lay the um the the the, the frame out on on the light box and just take a photo with with with, with my phone and uh, um then carry on through the uh, through through the through the film reel. Um, if um uh if there are um, tears in the film um. There are two options. The expensive option are splicers, which are devices that uh, traditionally put film back together. Um, but uh, these are now very hard to come by. Expensive. Um, the tape is expensive. Um, if you're going, to, if you're going to be continuing to wind through the film, the best thing to do is just use a little bit of artist's tape and uh, reattach it, and that should hold and allow you to actually finish the wind through. Um, just a quick note that. Winding film, it's a very quick skill to learn, but there's a lot of trial and error. So uh, a recommendation that's always made is to go online, once you've got your rewind set up, go online and buy a cheap 16 millimeter reel of junk film and just practice on that and destroy it if you have to, but uh, um, it's the best way to learn. Um, so what are the key things that you want to identify? If you're going to be reformatting your films, you need to know certain pieces of information. Uh, obviously the gauge. This is knowing what type of film it is. Um, but also um, the number of uh, perforations per image. You'll see in this image here is a, um, uh, is a four perf, um, 35 millimeter image. Um, and there is, there is three perf, um, 35 millimeter. So that can, if you were to put a three perf 35 millimeter film into a scanner that was set for four perfs, you would end up with every second frame being half a frame. Um, again, document if it's if it's if it's a positive or a negative. Um, one of the most helpful things about the digitization process is that negatives um, can be flipped to a positive in the in in just with the click of a button uh, on the computer, uh, as opposed to previously where you had to completely reprint the entire film. Um, the negatives will usually be closer to uh, the camera original, if not the camera original themselves. So they'll likely have the best image because, you know, as I said, generations, uh, copies of copies. Um, footage, uh, which is a confusing term because it also refers to what we see, but uh, footage is, is, is what we refer to as the length of, of, of the full reel when it's um, pulled out. Um, so you can actually deduce this um, by the diameter. If you measure the diameter of the, of, of, of the film or the core, particularly, to the end of the reel, 
Um, there are online resources for this. Uh, Kodak.com has a um, has a a a, a, a film uh, footage ga uh, gauge where you literally just you select what uh, whether it's 35, 16, and then you just say the uh, the the width of the of the wound film reel, and it tells you how long the film is. Um, you need to document any damage, uh, particularly to the sprocket holes, um, because uh, these need to thread the projector gears. Um, obviously, things like mold and decomposition uh, speak for themselves. Um, using a loop to uh, inspect the edge coat of, uh, edge coat of the film um, can give you incredibly vital information about your films. Um, so you'll see in this in the image here um, the we know that it's Kodak. Um, further along the strip, it will probably say if it's safety or nitrate, hopefully safety. Um, and uh, Kodak, as a company, um, had these uh, these two little uh, circles after Kodak um, are actually a um, the uh, creation date of the uh, represent the creation date of the the, the, the film stock. Um, these uh, these edge codes, this guide, you can find this very easily online. Um, they uh, they use these codes to actually say when the film was produced. That doesn't mean that's when the film was necessarily used. The whoever may have, whoever whoever shot the film may have um, may have purchased something in uh, 1963 and not used it till 1964 or five. But a circle triangle will give you a rough idea of um, of, of of when the, the the work was produced, which is very helpful for identifying the works. Um, inspecting video. Uh, it's a lot easier because a lot of the metadata is actually on the cassettes. Um, it just won't tell you what's on the tape. <laughs> um, the, uh, the information on the cassette that um, will inform you of the formats, the brand, um, there are usually windows, little plastic see-through windows on the, on the case where you can actually see the tape ribbon. Um, this allows you to kind of check if there's mold or maybe other damage problems that, that, that are visible, reasons to not put the, the, the cassette through. Um, um, sorry, this is just a quick question from uh, Shane Stevenson. Um, do you have a year when they switched from lacquer, uh, lacquer um, to, uh, or shellac to vinyl? I actually don't off the, um, off the top of my head, but I can, I can, I can get these things. Um, mo mostly shellac, are, I think, are pretty defunct after the 1930s, um, but uh, um, I can I can get back to you. There, just to clarify, there was there was there was a typo in that one um, in that one uh, um, uh, slide that should have said lacquer, comma shellac, uh, uh, comma vinyl, not lacquer, shellac, and vinyl. Um, so um, video cassettes have a uh, latch that um, protects the tape. Um, the uh, this opens up when the cassette is insert, inserted into the pl the player. The tape is then um, wound out and, and and read inside the machine. Um, this by opening this latch um, while the tape is outside the machine, this allows you to actually inspect the ribbon. Um, you may remember these uh, buttons on the side of VHS players. You literally push that in and you just lift up the the spring loaded latch at the top. Um, this allows you to kind of check if the, if the ribbon is in good condition, um, but also gives the only real way to conduct a smell test on uh, on a um, a VHS tape. Um, so um, each tape ta ta format has has different uh, release buttons. Um, in order to check a um, check a pneumatic tape, for example, you need to insert. Uh, a pen or a similar thing into into a a, uh, a hole on the top of the case there. Um, mini DVs, for example, have um, little uh, latches on the side for opening the the um, little levers, I should say, on the side for opening the latches. Um, if you, if you're in doubt, there's resources online. Um, always always good to just just double check and make sure the last thing you want to do is um, um, pardon me. Uh, Jessica Johnson is asking, uh, what kind of tape? Could you be more specific, please? Um, oh, what kind of splicing tape? Um, sorry. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the thing with film is that splicing tape, you actually need to use specifically 
a specific type of film, uh, a, a tape used for film. Uh, you can't just use um, things like, you know, um, scotch tape or equivalent. Uh, this is because you need it to be, the, the light needs to be able to get through it, so it needs to be the right density. Um, but also it needs to be, um, if you are reattaching two pieces of 35 millimeter film, um, you need those perforations to still exist. So by putting splicing tape over, you need a tape, to, uh, the, the, the actual type of splicing tape that are used are very easy to punch through, which um, allow um, um, the, uh, the new, new, new perforations to be created uh, so that you reattach the image, uh, the two images, and then it'll now, once, the, once the, the holes have been punched back into the perforation, which had been covered up by the tape, you can play it again on a projector or equivalent. Um, so, um, finally, this is, this is getting into the, into, into the weeds a little bit, but uh, you can open up a, a VHS tape uh, with relatively little difficulty. Yeah, it just takes a couple of screws. Uh, don't lose the screws, because I've done that, and it's terrible. Um, you know, this is very helpful for um, if you want to do like a very, uh, if, if you're uncertain about um, the results of your smell test, um, you can also splice um, video. Splicing video is a lot easier. Thanks to whoever, whoever was, who asked the, sorry, Jessica who asked the, the, the splicing question. Um, the uh, uh, with 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 video and audio, uh, you can actually splice with any kind of tape. The tape won't stop the. Um, I don't want to say any type of tape, obviously, but uh, uh, with, 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 with most thin tapes, um, because it won't um, cause uh, it won't cause the magnetic signal to stop being read. Um, so uh, you don't actually. It's not like it's not like film where you can, if you use the wrong kind of tape, you could lose two frames. You're not really going to lose much information by uh, uh, reattaching some um, uh, some 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 video or audio tape. Um, Recommendations to removal of mold. Um, I've done this with m small amounts of mold if they've grown on the outside of the reel. Um, this is this is just an isopropyl and uh, and um, and cotton bud situation. Um, it's uh, otherwise you need to you need to have you know someone who a, a, a professional clean it. Um, Unfortunately, but if it's just small amounts, yeah, you can you can wipe it away pretty easily. You just have to be very gentle because, of course, you can also wipe away the binder and therefore the information on the tape. Um, so just one last little thing. This is um, this is something that uh, I've seen too few too 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 many archives forget. Um, cassette tapes are purchased in what's called record mode, meaning they're ready to be recorded over, um, and all too often. Um, uh, all too often, um, they aren't put into safe mode um, once the thing has once once the, once the footage has been recorded. Um, it's hugely important that your tapes in your collection are put into safe mode before reformatting. Uh, this is even true if you're sending them out to a vendor. The last thing vendors are often working with so many tape decks at one time that one false button press and you know you'll lose all your all, all you the, the, some other tape will get recorded over your tape. It's it's not likely to happen. It could happen. We want to prevent these things from happening. Um, the uh, with more recent tape formats, uh, there's usually just a switch, um, and kind of in Betacam onwards, um, you uh, there's a switch from left to right on sorry, record safe. Um, but things like VHS, you may recall these little um, on the left here, these uh, little plastic tabs. Um, audio cassettes have them on the top as well. You literally just take a small screwdriver. And um, a flathead screwdriver, and you just put it in, and you lever it, and you just crack out the um, that little plastic tab, and um, does no damage to the cassette. It's it's not it's not replaceable, but it does no 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 damage to the cassette otherwise, uh, and it absolutely saves your film. Um, Umatics interestingly have these uh, little plastic buttons. Uh, put the buttons in, it, it can be recorded over. If you pop the button out, um, it's uh, it's safe. So what metadata do you want to record from your video? Well, um, format is uh, obviously the, uh, the fundamental requirement. Um, you know, you, you, you want to know what type of tape type, type, type you're, uh, you're copying, um, and um, you want to make sure that you have the, the decks to do, the correct decks to do that. Um, 
brand is um, is uh, is important to look out for. Um, as I said, there were a lot of like minor companies that produced very cheap um, brands of brands of video. If you recognize the brand, you know if it's your Sony's, your Maxells, your Fuji's, or Linaudio, 3M, TDK, Ampex, these are the ones that are more reliable, um, so they're less likely to be endangered. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be working towards preserving them, but if they're strange, kind of off the shelf. Um, off the shelf at a at a at a, at a CVS brand takes um, that uh, you're not quite sure where the where where um, you don't recognize the name maybe um, searching online doesn't give you much much of an idea of of, of, of of the brand of tape these are the ones that you really want to focus on they're the ones that are going to be made cheaply and quickly and where the binder probably isn't going to be as strong. Um, you also want to know, obviously, the, the the tape length. This will usually be written on the side of the cassette, um, but uh, different 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 tapes have different tape lengths. Um, VHS tapes can go up to 180 or 240 minutes. Um, pneumatics tend to be about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but uh, if it's if it's if it's if it's if, 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 if it's visible on the tape, um, make sure you uh, record it. Um, and then things like the condition, um, any damage odor, etc. Um, so the equipment you need to to inspect video. So as, 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 as I said, unlike film, you can't just, you know, um, um, you can't just l l look at the individual frames. It's, it's encoded information. Um, you want to handle all devices, um, such as VCRs and audio tape decks, with extraordinary care. Um, as I said before, the If um, if major repairs on a deck are required, um, you should bring in a professional to to help. Um, you need to know if your damaged deck is salvageable. Um, some of the uh, most common issues with video playback are caused by dirty video heads, and the video head is the part of the tape that reads the part of the machine, I should say, that reads the tape. Um, these can get clogged just with dust or dirt, or also actually residue scraped off from tape uh, from tape binder as tapes have gone through the machine. Um, cleaning a, a, a VCR is daunting, but it's actually not that hard. Um, you just want to unplug the machine. Um, you want to uh, uh, un uh, unscrew the screws, lift off the top shell, uh, shell, uh, shell um, and um, let me show you this. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is what the inside of a VCR looks like. Um, as I said, daunting, but um, the tape dr tape head drum is the circular um, uh, metal part in the uh, in the left image, um, and the tape heads are actually just like tiny, tiny little um, little holes. There should be one on each of four sides of it, and if you just lightly spin the drum uh, with a, um, a Q-tip with isopropyl on it, um, you can uh, very, very quickly um, clean and uh, have, have your, your deck back in working order. Um, so we're going to begin to reformat, finally, now that we know what we have. Um, first thing you want to do is identify the copies you're going to digitize um, and uh, document these carefully. Um, what are the key things to consider? Well, what is the generation of the media? Um, let's say you have two copies of the same work on Umatic and VHS. Um, clearly, the VHS was made as an easier to view access copy from the Umatic at some point. Um, because it's a derivative, the VHS will likely have an inferior signal to the Umatic tape. That said, uh, the Umatic tape will be older. It might not be in the same in, in, in the condition it once was, and you may also not have access to a Umatic tape deck, and you have access to a, a VHS deck. So you need to ask yourselves these questions. Um, you want to get the best uh, signal, you want to get the, the get the get the closest to the original, but you also need to work out what is actually manageable. Um, so um, consider the generation of the media um, and its condition, uh, the ease and cost of digitization. Uh, as I said. Um, VHS players are a lot easier to find than magnetic tape decks. Sorry, than, uh, than pneumatic tape decks. Um, 
you also want to think about um, what, the, what the deliverables are. Are you looking for a preservation copy of the original tape, or are you just trying to get an access copy? Because if you're just trying to get an access copy, you know the the best the best case in, in that pneumatic VHS one is to just put the VHS one and and make a make a quick copy. That's not a replacement. That is just something that will be easily viewable, maybe to put on your um, on on your YouTube channel or or, or what have you. Um, finally, the, there's issues of copyright. I I really don't want to get into this because it's 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 such a, a big issue. But y if you don't own the own 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 the rights or hold the rights to um, to to the works you're you're digitizing, you just need to be very cautious about that. And underlying rights are another issue where, say, you have video from some party um, and the music that was playing at the party. Um, if you don't have the rights to that music, <laughs> you're this is these 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 are not things you're likely to get caught for, but they're things to be aware of that your decisions that you're making. Um, so um, how do we identify the 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 key the, the key works um, that you should if 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 you have a large collection how are you going to identify what are the ones that you should focus on? Well, um, this is really up to you and the needs of your archive. Um, no one knows your collection better than you do. Um, what are the key the key AV works in the collection? Um, what works would complement those that are already available? Um, what is the demand for access? Um, Will the will will this be greater once people know what it is and that it's available? Uh, do you have video and audio masters or negatives? Um, if not, do you know who does? So you you need to ask yourself if you have a copy and another institution has a copy and their copy you suspect might be a better copy. What is the purpose of digitizing your copy? Um, obviously, you can't tell another institution that they they need to digitize their copy, but it's these are things you you can you can perhaps negotiate. Um, you don't the waste you know wasting resources on creating something that already has a um, already has avail available or better assets is just something to consider. Um, there are also a lot of hidden costs of digitization. Um, for example, when you've finished digitizing the work, um, does it require further editing? Um, Perhaps you're digitizing, you know, um, outtakes from a news show or something like that. Will they need to be put into a, a new piece together? Um, also, color correction, um, especially if the, if for example, uh, with um, with film, if the color has faded, you know, do you want to attempt to reproduce digitally the original colors? Um, these these costs can add up. Um, um, it's also worth thinking that if, for example, you have a higher generation, an earlier generation film that has color faded and a more recent reproduction um, that hasn't color faded, yes, the uh, the um, the original will have a better image, but again, you 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 want those colors, right? Um, so um, there's also the issue of sound. Um, that may need to be synchronized to the film or video. Um, they'll need to be combined. These are all just you know addition, additional things that can build up after you've digitized, and just it's worth considering. So you're beginning in, in his uh, reformatting project. Um, you need to make sure that uh, all the components um, to be digitized, all of the equipment that'll be running on them, have been inspected, cleaned, and repaired as required. Uh, next, you're going to want to think about um, all of the costs that digitizing in-house will accrue. Um, so you need to think about how much equipment do you need to purchase? How much will it cost to maintain it? Um, digitization is a time-consuming project. Um, analog assets have to be run their full duration to be transferred to a digital medium. So uh, whereas you can scan a, pay, a, a, a page of paper you know, very quickly, faster than it takes to read, um, you have to play a 90-minute film, or well, a 20-minute film reel for 20 minutes. Uh, same with the same with the videotape. Um, so, who's going to be doing this? Um, do you have the staffing for this? Uh, and does your staff have the time? Um, you could hire a specialist uh, to come in and work with the collection for a limited period. Um, those contracts can be costly, however. Um, the quality of work might be better than if 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 you were to handle the task yourself. 
but again, these these are ex expensive. These can be expensive issues. Um, finally, and and this goes for whether you are digitizing in house or with an external vendor. I I, I need to specify that. Um, um, sorry, I, I, I skipped I skipped one. Sorry. Um, you need to also think. Sorry, do you have the uh, the the space for uh, the digital files you've been creating? Um, we'll get back a little bit a little to this towards the end, but. Um, you you know can you afford the cost of purchasing additional memory um, as digital video files can take up a huge amount of hard drive space. Um, and finally, um, digitization it's it's not an excuse to deaccession uh, film and video assets. Um, the, you're creating backups and you're creating access files. Uh, you're creating preservation files. You're not creating digital replacements of formerly analog media. Uh, hard drives fail all the time. Data becomes corrupted. Um, while film and video assets suffer from slow decay, if you care for them, you can prevent that for some time, perhaps centuries in the case of film. Um, you should always hold on to the original media carrier uh, in case you ever need to return to the source. Um, so for uh, in-house film digitizing, um, you're going to need a film scanner. Um, these come in many sizes at wildly varying costs, um, and of course, course in different gauges. Um, so an 8 millimeter scanner and a 35 millimeter scanner are not going to be the same machine. Um, a lot of the information I'm going to give here is going to be about products that are very likely completely outside of your institution's budget. Um, but I want to make you aware of the options, particularly because these are what you would hope that vendors might have if you're choosing to, um, to work with a vendor. Um, there are two types of film scanner. Uh, the first is the most common, which is uh, an intermittent pull-down uh, scanner. This works in the same way as a projector does. The um, little uh, uh, sprockets turn the uh, turn 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 the film by its um, by its uh, um, preparations. Um, um, and then a digital camera basically take, takes a capture, just moves it along, takes a takes a photo, moves it along, takes a photo. Um, audio is captured separately by a different reader on the device. Um, the second is what's called a continuous motion scanner. Uh, this uses rollers to kind of gently push the film along and past a capture lens. Um, they're more expensive, um, but uh, they can be necessary for works um, if the perforations in your film are completely damaged from maybe years of playing or something, some, some other disaster that happens to, happen to the, the film reel. If the perforations aren't, aren't there, you can't put it through an intermittent pull-down scanner. Um, so uh, you will need to use a, um, a continuous motion scanner in that case. Um, some models will actually photograph the entire the entire film strip, not just the frame, which is great for actually collecting the metadata that's in the edges of the uh, the, the film strip, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in major film archives, um, ultrasonic cleaners are used to uh, shift dust and debris from the film before capture. Um, while what's called a wet gate scanner is can be used, uh, where the film basically is goes through the scanning process, but basically in a in a in a fluid, um, and what that does is it causes the light to refract less through the film, so that scratches don't appear quite as wide because the light isn't kind of being bounced around through the film strip. Um, Again, these devices, they, they can be prohibitively expensive, um, but uh, they're out there. So it really depends on, uh, on how important um, the, you know, the in, 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 individual uh, uh, film reels might be. Um, here are some, these are some high-end uh, um, uh, machines. Uh, these things will set you back four to five figures. Uh, the ARRI scan on the right is, is, a, is a wet gate scanner. Um, but let's say you want to do it. Um, a little bit more affordable end of the spectrum. Um, there are uh, a number of smaller scanners that function just like film projectors. Um, so this uh, Wolverine um, uh, eight millimeter super and super eight uh, um, um, duo uh, combo uh, um, scanner um, so is actually only about four hundred, five hundred dollars. Um, the uh, um, there's also what's called a sniper. Uh, which is essentially just a reformatted projector with a digital camera put on the end of it. Um, this Elmo is a pretty high-end um, one. It's uh, a little over a thousand dollars, but uh, you can you can get cheaper ones. And there are certain archives I've seen that have actually built their own um, 
simply using a an old projector and a uh, and a, and, a, and basically but little more than a camcorder, but uh, um, it can be done. Okay, so then video. Um, the complexities of analog signal uh, can require an extraordinary amount of equipment to digitize to an acceptable standard. Um, so that's, you know, you want a preservation copy and not just an access, access copy. Um, you need to just consider that you're turning an interlaced video into a stable image. Um, the best way to describe this is think of when you were watching a VHS tape in the 90s and you paused it, you didn't get a single frame. Uh, you were getting a kind of juddering mix of two consecutive images. Um, so what the process needs to do is actually convert that into single images, uh, which is, it's a pretty complicated process. Um, so uh, the, the quality of what you capture uh, is only as good as the signal that you're receiving. Um, so assembling all the equipment, it can feel a little bit like you're building your own miniature TV studio. Uh, the mass of cables can be intimidating. Um, the equipment uh, you purchase for your video rack will depend both on the quality of video capture you're, do, you're, 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 you're planning and also the formats you're handling. Um, costs can run high um, and many of the items will need to be purchased secondhand via eBay or similar online sources, but large video collections that demand digitization over the long term, um, the benefits of being able to do this in-house are huge and the savings will add up. So if you're going to build out a video rack, uh, here are the things you absolutely need. Uh, you need the decks for your format. Uh, if, you've got, if you've got enough Umatic tapes, you're going to want a Umatic tape deck. Um, you'll want a CRT monitor, um, classic old TV. This is because you'll want to see how the video is supposed to look um, so that you know it, it, um, you can compare the final digital file to what it actually is meant to look like on a television. Um, there are cheaper digital op uh, options uh, available at the monitors, but they won't replicate the analog image with the same fidelity. Um, there's what's called a time-based corrector. Um, this steadies the rate of the signal. Essentially, um, the video is going through the deck so fast that the signal's kind of coming off in bursts. Um, and if played for long enough without a time-based corrector, the sync between the video image and the sound can go kind of haywire. Um, a time-based corrector is basically just a device that just smoothens out the video signal into a steady stream. Um, the, uh, you can also get time-based correctors that have um, processing amplifiers built in. These actually allow you to kind of play around a little bit with, um, with elements of the video signal, such as the hue and the chroma, um, so that if, if you're using looking at the monitor, you can decide how the tape looks and what actually looks best, essentially what looks closest to either natural or closest to, you know, what 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 what's what's the tape uh, originally looked like before it's act before that is being captured. Um, you're also going to need a computer. Um, this will be, be at the other end uh, to uh, connect to these devices and receive the analog to uh, uh, digital signal. Um, again, I just want to. Uh, remind you that if the video format is a digital format like um, like mini DV, uh, like Digi Beta, uh, you don't need the majority of this equipment. Uh, most of it can be transferred uh, relatively easily. Um, just here some of the some 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 of the hardware. That's a, a pretty good uh, time-based corrector. There's your CRT. Um, a switcher box is actually just a device that decides the signal path, um, which. So, for example, if you're sending the the umatic signal to the CRT, or if you're sending it to the um, to the to the computer for capture, um, um, the this Blackmagic analog to digital converter here, this is the device that goes between your 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 switcher. Uh, sorry, between your switcher will go to your time-based corrector, your time-based corrector will go to your um, your your analog to digital converter, and that goes into your um, into your computer, um, which will bring in a um, a digitized uh, um, image of um, of the video capture. Um, this is this is the heavy stuff. But uh, if you really want to do a big project in house, um, you're going to want to look at uh, getting some oscilloscopes, um, vector scopes, waveform monitors. These can be purchased relatively easily online. Um, 
but uh, um, they basically allow you to control things like brightness, um, the black levels to let you know when you're actually kind of bursting through the recommended uh, limits. Um, and an audio mixer below is, is another, it will also go from the tape deck to the, uh, the Blackmagic converter. And um, this allows you just to control just how, much, how loud the audio signal going to the uh, computer is. Some software options, uh, AGM Mini Config, Blackmagic Media Express. Um, these, are, these are just what you'll install on the computer to actually bring in the, 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 the files and capture them as um, high quality um, preservation, digital preservation files. Um, there's not much difference between the two, uh, per se. Um, ideally, you want to use the one that matches, if you have a Blackmagic um, analog to, to video converter, uh, analog to digital converter, it's probably better to use Blackmagic Media Express, um, and same for if you have an, uh, an Aja. Um, but uh, um, for those of you who like to read it really technical, um, Blackmagic has an open source software development kit, so um, that is an option for uh, what you're actually doing with for cha for changing what you're receiving in the video file, but uh, again, this is uh, a little a, li a little bit more uh, in depth than what we're going to do here today. Um, so um, things to know for digitizing video: um, you want to turn on all of the equipment um, 20 minutes before using it. That's just because a lot of these old equipment they they literally just need to warm up. Um, but uh, um, and also, just good, good, to, good, 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 good to know that they are turning on and they are working. Um, you want to carefully plot out the signal path um, and document the decisions you're making. Make sure that you know like which cables are connecting to which devices, and um, you can plan it out. You can use a chart to plan it out. Um, but uh, the idea is just to know what signal is being received where. You know what's going through which scopes or which. Um, with, you know what, what the time-based correct, uh, corrector is um, is connected to. Um, have a ta have a test tape ready. Um, something you can you can junk um, re easily enough. You know because the last thing you want to do is discover the day the, of your digitization project that uh, your VHS player is eating the tapes. Um, so uh, you know ne ne never never put in an important work in your collection Just in, 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 into, the, into the machine first. Um, Finally, at the other end, for quality control, you'll want to play the digital file that you create through. Uh, if you don't have time to watch a 20, 30 minute tape, uh, 20, 30 minute file, um, at least you know watch like a minute from the beginning, a middle from a minute from the middle, and a minute from the end. Uh, that'll really help to um, to you know give you give you a sense that the file came out you know in good quality, um, good sound, in sync. Um, and um, preferably with uh, with as few uh, video or digital errors as possible. Um, if you need to digitize on a budget, these are not things I recommend, but these are things I know people like. Um, there are a couple of ways you can just do really quick access, standard definition access copies. Um, one option is to get a dual DVD VHS player. They usually have a button um, where you can actually just you know, pr uh, pr press play on the DVD, press record, uh, sorry, press play on the VHS, press record on, on, on the DVD if you've got a write writable DVD uh, available, and it'll create a DVD, a pretty poor, but a, a workable DVD copy um, that you can then transfer any way you wish. Um, some digital video players, I mentioned uh, mini DV players earlier, um, they actually still had video imports. Um, and because they have out ports that go that can go in be hooked up to a um, a digital monitor or a digital computer, you can actually create a signal path from a VHS player into a mini DV player into a um, into a, a a computer. Again, these are a kind of emergency uh, access required um, uh, situations, but you know. Sometimes there's an emergency. Sometimes you really need to know what's. You really, you really need to need, need, need to get a digital copy of a tape. Uh, maybe you need to send it to someone who's outside of your archive or equivalent. Um, audio. I'm just going to fly through this because thankfully audio is a lot less complicated. Um, it's um, you know you just you want to have the right audio tape deck um, for your audio tape collection. Um, if you have open reel, you need an open reel player. Um, you want to connect it. You want to be able to connect it to your to your, to, to your computer. 
um, you want to inspect the uh, inspect the tape and clean the machine. Very similar, slightly less complicated than a VHS player. Um, tape speed is just about how 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 fast the tape was put through the recorder. Um, so you want to play back at the same same tape speed. It usually should give you an idea on the tape, uh, what tape, what tape speed it was recorded at, um, and you just want to adjust your settings on the tape deck to that. Um, azimuth um, is a, um, it's, well, it's actually the term to refer to the angle between the tape head and the tape. Um, if you want to get a high quality um, um, signal from a from an audio tape. The azimuth needs to be in the exact same place that the that the tape head was that recorded to that tape. Um, so the reason this is important is that if you're playing a tape and you're getting a really really bad signal, it's very possible that the azimuth was off in the original uh, tape recorder. So you can actually use you usually just use a screwdriver. There's a there's a place inside to do this. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't have an image of this, but uh, um, just to do a little tweak to kind of try different angles for the, it varies, this is very, very, very tiny, tiny angle, angle change, but you can dramatically change the quality of the audio that you get off the tape by adjusting the azimuth. Um, there's a lot of software out there for recording audio. Uh, Boom Recorder is a great one, pretty cheap, and um, will give you a really, really, really good uh, audio file at the other end. Um, so you know, working with vendors, um, you'll want to shop around. You'll want to you want to ask around. Um, you want to find the right vendor for you and your collection. And your collection. Um, you know, obviously, cost is going to be an issue. Uh, shipping distance is going to be an issue. If if uh, um, if there's a a, 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 a a cheap vendor a state over, and there's a, an expensive vendor down the road, you know, eventually, eventually, the uh, the cost of shipping, you know. A collection in various loads might actually, you know, balance out that uh, that 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 cost differential. Um, you also want to look at their turnaround and their backlog. Um, you want to know like how quickly can they get these the the digital files back to you, um, and um, you want to know like how much they're actually working on right now, preferably, um, because a lot of vendors these days are slammed um, with uh, with um, uh, tapes and. and and films, um, and you want to know the capacity of what they can what they can take from you. Um, you want to know, you know, can they how many how many how many tapes of yours can they juggle at a time, um, and um, how quickly they, they'll be able to get back to you. Um, for uh, video and audio files, um, you want to know the quality of what they're producing. Um, you want to know what types of files they're able to produce and whether or not they fit with what you'll want at the other end. Um, a good way of, of, of uh, working out file quality is to ask them if they'd offer you know, a free test tape, um, where you send them one tape in your collection and they, do a, uh, they, 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 they digitize it and see if, um, see if you like uh, the results. Um, probably a good way to get a quick freebie. Um, some vendor options in the New York uh, state area. Um, um, actually, yeah, um, uh, Lorena Salva there says um, there's a risk of losing artifacts if sent through the mail, um, which is absolutely, yeah, um, you do want to be very careful. Um, I, um, some discussion of, 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 of packing later, but uh, um, that is something that I may not have mentioned, so uh, thank you, Lorraine. Um, these are some, some, vendor, some major vendor options. Um, George Blood are one of the best in the business for audio. Um, BB Optics do incredible um, film restoration. Um, so you know it, it's uh, there, are, there, are, there are lists I can make these available. Um, but uh, there are a number of lists online of, of just you know the the, the, the the best vendors in the business um, who you might want to work with. And again, it's just about um, um, you know sending an RFP out and uh, working out um, what is um, what is the best bet for you. Um, if you're building an RFP, um, you want to uh, you want to know you know you want them to know these are things you want them to know. Uh, you want them for them to know the the, the project. Um, you know, are all these tapes part of one coll collection? How do they relate to one another? Um, obviously, the number of reels and tapes that you're hoping to be digitized. Um, 
most importantly, you want to know they you want them to know what the required deliverables are. Um, so assumably, you'll probably want you know a preservation master file. Um, you'll want um, an access copy. Uh, you'll want metadata that fits your needs. Um, you know, if you don't spell these things out, then you know the danger is you won't get them back uh, the way you want them. Um, again, you know, build build a timeline um, that you would like them to meet. You know, they might say, you know, adjust that, telling you what what the actual options are. But you know, if if if, if you don't if you don't build a build, build that kind of schedule at a turnaround time, then the danger is that they they won't meet it and won't won't meet, won't, won't meet your needs. Um, so uh, just some requirements that you should 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 demand essentially of a vendor. Um, you'll want um, the registrar to contact you to let to let you know that once they've received um, a, um, a a collection from, from from you, that's you know every item is accounted for. Um, you want to make sure that they are handling and caring for your assets exactly as well as you would. Um, why would you entrust your assets to uh, someone who's not going to? Um, you want to know about their storage, their environmental control, their security. You know, you you want to make sure they have um, they're 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 tre treating treating your and and protecting your your assets as as well as you might, um, preferably even better. Um, and then um, things like that they are that they are upkeeping their equipment. I mean, I've I've already spelt out the ways to um, to upkeep uh, film and and, and 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 video equipment. You know, it's one thing for for a small archive to you know to try and do its best. A major vendor needs to be needs to be doing all of these things. Um, you also want to, um, uh, if they do any modification, uh, 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 any modification treatments to a um, to a tape or a film, um, you want to request notification. For example, if uh, if they find a videotape um, that they strongly suspect has sticky shed, one of the best things to do as a kind of temporary. Um, um, Temporary uh, measurement uh, is to use what they use a science oven and actually literally or well, semi-literally bake, bake the tape. It's referred to as baking the tape in in in, in, in the business. Um, and what that does is it um, it uh, it basically softens up the um, the uh, the binder and makes it stops it from actually flaking off and shedding inside inside the uh, inside the machine. But it's it's it will long term reduce the longevity of your tape. So if they're going to be making decisions like that, that they want to do this before putting it through, this is your call. This is not their call. So they should be contacting you of any treatments that they're making. Um, again, they're going to cal calibrate their machines for every reel and tape, um, detailing any errors um, that, they, that, that are made in the transfer process. And especially, they want to know if these errors are inherent in the work, if there are errors in the videotape, or if they're digital errors that were created during the transfer process, um, if uh, if it's the latter, um, you know they should probably, you know, uh, try to uh, do the transfer again. Um, that said, they should not be transferring tapes twice without your permission, um, because you know again unwarranted wear. Um, so um, and again they want to record and deliver all. Um, Metadata. Uh, continue transfer until the end of the tapes. This is just a lot of tapes go black, and then it looks like the tape is done, and there is more stuff at the end. Um, you want to request, and you should also be doing this when you're recording your own, um, digitizing in-house, is to just make sure that beginning to end of every tape and every film reel is uh, is digitized. Um, packing. I'm gonna. We're running a little over, so so I'm gonna go through this very quickly, but. Uh, um, Packing is important. Um, you know, uh, cassettes are easy to stack. Uh, stack um, so that's pretty. You can fill a box with with, with cassettes with real ease. But um, um, film should be uh, should be shipped in cans that are appropriately sized. And you know, you want to pack them from the inside so the film is not rattling around in there. Um, and make sure you're doing a full inventory. And as uh, Lorraine said already, um, you know, just be careful with what um, with what uh, shippers you're using. Um, uh, QCing files, um, doing quality control. Um, you want to do this as soon as you start getting files back from the vendor, because as I said, you want to make sure that they're doing the right job. Um, always view the 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 middle, the first minute, the, the middle minute, the final minute of any file, um, and also consider the color and sound quality, and not just the image quality that you're getting. Um, so deliverables are going to vary depending on the needs and capacity of your digital archive. Um, 
you're likely to want a you know an uncompressed preservation file um, and um, the uh, you know the file type and the wrapper is really going to depend on your needs and your software and equipment um, you know I, I, I don't want to get too much in 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 in, 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 in into digital preservation here but um, you know you 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 want these files to be the best quality um, um, and uh, you want them you also want them to be able to be played on you know suitable software so for example with an access cut co access copies that you make you're going to want them to have an easy to read format like mp4 that most um, most devices will be able to play because I mean what's the point of an access copy if 70% of computers can't play it um, you also want the technical metadata to be embedded within the files so that um, you know when you when you when you when you right click on a on, on, on a media file you can actually see a lot of the info you want that and the metadata embedded and, and the um, the vendor should be doing that for you um, some very quick notes on digital storage um, video files can be huge uh, anyone who's ever had a smartphone and a dog or a cat knows this all too well um, a, 7, a 720p which is standard HD video can take up to 10 gigabytes of space per hour of footage um, so you know be certain your digital archive is equipped is equipped to, uh, to store this um, you also want to consider digital preservation tools such as Bagot and preferably request that a um, a vendor is actually bagging files uh, before they send them to you um, and again this is classic digital preservation stuff but back everything up you want at least one copy in a separate location to your archive um, so finally um, which do you want to do look it's 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 all about time and money um, but also the size of the collection how urgent is this project? Um, can it be performed on request? If you're going to be getting um, patrons asking for individual tapes at a time, it is really great to be able to do this in-house. Um, but do you have the capital? Do you have the, have the money, the space, and the staffing for that? Um, and um, can you meet the costs and suffer the delays of outsourcing? Um, these are uh, these are the questions that you, that you need to be asking. There's, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, there's no right or wrong way to reformat an audiovisual collection. There's only the wrong or right people doing it. Um, I've seen small archives do amazing things with the right equipment. Um, it requires a lot of uh, um, willingness to learn new, 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 new skills and uh, and a lot of you know as you've seen today. There's, there's a lot of science in this and there's a there's a lot of organization it's it's um it's very different to um to to you know traditional paper paper uh handling um but you know it's it's all doable uh you just have to be, have to be, have to be willing um vendors who digitize you know they are trained specialists so you know they they have reputations to uphold so you know for the most part if if they come recommended they're likely trustworthy you know it's um it's going to be your call, but uh, um, you know, the the, the 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 choice is up to you whether or not you decide to go 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 in as a with a vendor. The main thing, as I said before, is make sure that you are keeping the reels and tapes in your collection. Um, these things are the original works; um, they are the historical assets. Um, and uh, yeah, um, at that point, uh, we're pretty much finished. All right, if there are any questions, I can. Um, I can handle. Um, let me see here. Uh, so Matthew DeLeon here is saying um, Cook County uh, historian, uh, Cook, Cook County historian, is in the process of uh, converting 36 years of audio VHS and uh, DVD to MP4 for online archive and reference. It's incredible. Um, uh, as well as 16 millimeter films um chose a, 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 a vendor route um but uh, very interesting storage of originals once complete um you know i i i didn't have have, have, have space to, the, for uh, for the a full discussion of um of uh you know how to preserve the files once they're in your collection um yeah this is um um again you know back up your files um, 
if you're not familiar with Bagus, uh, I really, really recommend reading up on it. It's just a great way of, um, of both storing files together, but also it creates checksums uh, so that you can find out if when you remove a, um, or not remove, when you, when you, uh, w when you look at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a file in your archive, you can actually check if any, um, if any digital errors have happened to the file just through it being stored. Um, again, I, 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 I'm not a bag expert. Uh, I've used it but, uh, a number of times, but uh, um, it's really easy to use and it's an incredible way to, uh, to, to preserve your, your files. Um, Audrey uh, Malakowski asks, um, uh, so she, she's interested in storage of originals once reformatted. Um, you know, I, I mean, I talked about how to how to how to how to care for your your, your video and film assets. Um, you know, it's 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 about humidity. It's about uh, humidity. It's about temperature. Keeping those low. Um, and um, you know, the 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 thing is that the technologies keep getting better. And um, the, so the main reason to keep these things, aside from the fact that they have historical value, is um, you never know when there's going to be a possibility for a vital work to uh, to be digitized at a higher quality. Um, you also don't know, you know, you also you need to consider these as, although they're the originals, they're also, you know, they, they play backups to your digital preservation files as well. Um, Um, Audrey asks again, um, I know keeping them on site is ideal, but uh, would deep storage be advisable? Absolutely, yeah. I've, um, I've, I've packaged collections for sending to, you know, Iron Mountain or, or, uh, or other, um, other uh, off-site ven uh, um, storage vendors. Um, there's, you know, if, if, if the institution is trustworthy um, and if you feel that you're not likely to need to pull out the original any, any, any time soon, you know, and if, if you just if you know if space is a severe issue, then absolutely, um, there's there's no reason to not uh, reach out and uh, and see if there is a good affordable place to um, um, to store. Uh, you know, just just make sure that, you know you're separating your film and your video from your other you know from your, from from your paper records that are being sent to deep storage because um, you know they they all have different storage requirements. Are there any uh, final questions? I'm oh, getting lots of thank yous. Okay, um, so this is, I, I think we'll draw that to an end. Um, these slides uh, will be made available. Um, uh, I can be reached, um, and uh, you know, if, if you need to follow up on anything, um, and. Uh, Hopefully this has uh, been a benefit. I'm just, you know, I'm very passionate about uh, about AV collections, and a lot of people just find find it o an overwhelming concept of when to start, um, where where to start, and uh, I hope that this is uh, maybe giving giving you some ideas. But um, best of luck, and uh, I look forward to seeing uh, what, what 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 you have in your collections in future. Thank you, everyone.